Okay, this video is Obesity Causes Part 7, and we're going to talk about how to lose weight. And I divided this up into a couple different steps. And the first strategy, I'm going to use like these great military heroes like uh, this David here. This is the statue of David by Michelangelo, and it's magnificent. And so David, you know, successfully fought against Goliath with one fell swoop with a slingshot. And the point I'm going to say to you is the big one fell swoop is to go very low fat, whole food, plant-based diet, 100% vegan, you know, salt, oil, sugar free. Sometimes people put the word sofas in there also including flour and artificial sweeteners free. And that gives you dietary control of your health. You put everything in a big strong direction. And the other thing I wanna tell you is you have to forget social thinking. Social thinking is good for social situations. When in Rome do as the Romans do, you know, go with the flow, everything in moderation, that's fine for getting along with people. That is not how you should think about health. The way to think about health, you should think of it almost like religion, like the Ten Commandments. If an alcoholic, you're talking to an alcoholic, you don't tell him have a beer, you can have one beer every day, you tell him you can never touch a drop of alcohol again. No, no alcohol, not one drop. You don't, you don't tell a smoker you can have a cigarette, you tell him never smoke a cigarette again. You know, when you married a woman, you can't have your old girlfriend once in a while, okay? You just don't go with her anymore. And what I'm saying is, I talk to all these people, they're all fat and sick and pathetic, and they keep on wanting, well, can I have a little meat? Can I have a little oil? And I know those people are not going to be successful. A person who's going to be successful is somebody who says, what else can I do? What else can I do? I want to be successful. This is important. My life depends on this. Okay, so this is your big, giant step to go whole food, low fat, uh, I call it very low fat because I'm talking like 10% or less because a lot of uh, scientific articles are really bogus. They'll talk about low fat and the people are eating, you know, 30% fat, which I would consider quite high fat. So, and somebody had recommended to me to call it very low fat and I think that's a reasonable thing to do. No nuts because nuts are about 70 to 90% fat. I recommend no seeds. I recommend no caffeine. It's a stress equivalent. You don't want that. No oil, not one drop. Just like Dr. Esselstyn says, no oil, not one drop. No meat, not one bite. Um, for Esselstyn's coronary artery disease reversal patients, he didn't have even require them to do any exercise uh, or anything else. He, his feeling was people only have so much willpower and self-control, so just get them to eat the right diet is enough. And that's all it takes to get the system to work. Lots of docs have shown that the very low-fat vegan diet is very helpful for optimizing body weight and you know, preventing atherosclerosis, including the work of Dr. Dean Ornish, Walter Kempner, uh, John McNugal, as well as Nathan Pritikin's work, Chef AJ's work, and, and others. Everybody, you know, goes down this routine of almost entirely plant-based, better yet 100% plant-based, uh, low-fat plants. You know, they move towards optimizing their body weight, and they don't develop atherosclerosis. Okay, no processed food, not one bite. It's a good way to avoid all the MSG and MFG stuff, which can get you addicted to foods. MFG is manufactured-free glutamate. Um, I recommend no sweets. You can avoid all that industrial processed, uh, high fructose corn syrup and whatnot. Uh, artificial sweeteners, we talked about in the previous lecture, how those actually lead to weight gain. Um, if you're going to store water, put it in glass, not in these plastic bottles. There's so much plastic that it's something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. If you put that in your internet browser, you'll see there's all this plastic accumulating in the oceans. It's a big mess. Um, this is a quote from Doug Lyle, PhD. He's a psychologist that worked with Dr. McDougall. He's a real bright guy. He says, less than 5% of the population is able to find out about the vegan diet, motivated to learn it, and conscientious enough to follow it. I can tell you, most of the people I talk to, they all say me the same thing. Oh, doc, I eat well, lots of chicken and fish, which is, you know, they don't know any better. They mean well, but that's a completely ignorant thing to say. Those are very high fat foods. Uh, with estrogenic contaminations that just make you fat and sick. Okay, for additional steps in diet, in diet. So this now is what's called the Fabian strategy. And the Fabian strategy is named after a great Roman uh, general, Quintus Fabius Maximus. Okay, so there's the Fabian strategy. And this comes from the Carthaginian Wars, the Punic Wars, with uh, Carthage between Rome. And Hannibal was the great general of Carthage. And in one battle at Cannae, he killed like he killed or captured over 60,000 Romans. The Romans were very afraid of him. Um, he has a jar full of their rings here. And okay, so this is a statue of Hannibal. And the reason I mention this is the Romans had realized they simply could not go head to head 
with Hannibal and the Carthaginians or they would get their butt kicked. So Fabius came up with a strategy of just doing a whole bunch of little tricks and avoiding a big front-to-front -front confrontation with the Carthaginians. And he ended up being successful and leading to the defeat of Hannibal. So what am I talking about here is you've already gone 100% whole food plant-based. Start doing all these little tricks. Like Chef AJ is the one who's developed these tricks the most. Things like eat veggies first. Eat your veggies at the beginning of the meal. Eat your veggies for breakfast. That'll stretch your stomach, help to satisfy your, your hunger. She drinks the, the water that she boiled the veggies and calls it pot liquor. Okay. Um, Eat food that is low in caloric density, so you stretch your stomach with fewer calories, so you satisfy your hunger with fewer calories, and you end up losing weight. When you eat a low-fat diet, you reset your body weight set point and your, your hunger satisfaction set point to a lower number of calories. You can walk while you're eating. That improves your insulin sensitivity. Learn to manage your stress, because your stress elevates cortisol, and that eventually leads to weight gain and especially visceral fat. Get adequate sleep because that's a stress equivalent, which will elevate cortisol and uh, lead to weight gain. Avoid caffeine because that's a stress equivalent. Elevates cortisol will lead to weight gain. Uh, exercise helps, especially for fitness more so than weight loss, but it, it contributes to improved muscle tone, improved self-esteem, um, better sleep. You need your sunshine, get vitamin D. That improves your overall health more so than just for weight. Maintain your relationships. You know, having good some good social relationships helps lower your stress level. Religion helps lower a person's stress level. Religious people are a lot more healthy than non-religious people, and that's not widely talked about. It's sort of, you know, in fashion nowadays to not talk about religion, but they're much healthier than other people. So there's a big uh, benefit to it in that sense. Okay, now another aspect of strategies. This is Napoleon, magnificent drawing here by Jacques Louis David when he was coming over the Alps to go into Italy. And then later on, Napoleon, you know, went in and attacked Russia. And um, here's the strategy of Napoleon retreating from Russia. This is a painting, beautiful painting by Maisonnier, 1864. <clears throat> and you can see they're looking kind of tired. They're starving. It's like a scorched earth policy. There's no, there's no food there. And what am I talking about here? To avoid these obesogenic chemicals. Lots of people are exposed to tons of these things. Unless you're aware of them, you're probably being exposed to a lot of them. So the best strategy is to become a, a minimalist so you don't keep exposing yourself to estrogenic chemicals. They tell you to gain weight. With the same amount of calories, the more estrogenic chemicals you have in your body, the more difficult it is going to be to lose weight. And this is things like avoid plastics. Meat tends to have a lot of estrogen. They give estrogen to the animals to make them get fat faster. Filter your water. There's tons of estrogen in municipal water unless you use a carbon filter to remove it. You need at least a carbon filter to remove it. It's nice to have a whole house carbon filter in a kitchen. Reverse osmosis filter is a good way to go. Okay, what's the healthiest food in the world? Sweet potatoes. Okay, why are sweet potatoes the healthiest in the world? Well, first of all, potatoes, rice, and sweet potatoes all have about 1% fat. And the lower the percent fat in your diet, the faster you will lose weight. Okay, you're stretching your stomach better with minimal fat. Fat. McDougall has a famous quote, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. The more fat you eat, the fatter you get. Okay, um, lower in protein is also better. You're less likely to turn on mTOR, which promotes fat accumulation as well. So what I love about sweet potatoes is not only are they super low in fat, they're also quite low in protein, only about 4.5% protein. You want low protein. you got to get all this modern, you know, sad diet nonsense out of your head because the average person I talk to, they think, Oh, I need to get protein, I need to get calcium. That's completely wrong. There's, and I need to get good fats. There's no such thing as good fats. Um, it's impossible to be too low in protein. It's impossible to be too low in fat. So how can you know that that is a true statement? If you think about it a little bit, it'll make sense, okay? Think about breast milk. It's about 5 to 6% protein. That's at our maximum phase of growth in life. It's impossible to eat less than that on any natural occurring diet. There's been people on 2.5% protein. I've given a bunch of separate lectures on this topic, and you can see all the references in those other lectures. But And Dr. McDougall will tell you, he's never seen a protein deficient patient in his life, not one. I've never seen one either. It's just not going to happen. With any natural occurring diet, it's impossible. And the same thing with being fat deficient. It is impossible to be fat deficient on a normally naturally occurring diet of plant foods. It's just impossible. There's plenty of omega-3s in there. There's plenty of fat. They fed people in the Winnet study and McKean study less than 1% fat. And the people are fine. Okay, part of it's because they get secret fat, so to speak, from the fiber. I've given other lectures on that, you know. 
The only good fat is fiber fat, secret fat. Okay, so anyways, regular potatoes are about 9% protein. Depending on what you read, some rice claims to be as low as 5% in protein. Other rices go all the way up to 8, even 8.5% 8 protein. So what exactly is rice? I'm talking about white rice. Just say it's maybe about 7% protein. Um, but sweet potatoes are, are significantly lower. And, you know, the Papua New Guinea population gets about 93% of their calories uh, from sweet potatoes. And they were rather robust and healthy, despite the fact they smoked a lot. They had much lower cancer than the Americans who also smoked. And it's thought because of their low-fat diet. So anyway, sweet potatoes, they taste great, super low in fat, super low in protein. That's what you want. Okay, what about fruits? Fruits cause a lot of controversy. And I think that if a person is active... You know, uh, you know, a robust, active, athletic person, they can eat a lot of fruit. They're burning a lot of calories. You know, Garth Davis, who's the bariatric surgeon, became a triathlete, said he's been impressed by how skinny and healthy many of the fruitarians are that he has seen. Durian Ryder is a real famous guy, and I like Durian Ryder, and he's an athletic guy. He runs and races. He rides his bicycle in competitions and whatnot, and he loves eating fruits, and he also even eats uh, sugar around competition. And he's got these foxy girlfriends, and he says he gets them to lose weight by making them eat more sugar. Okay, he lives in like Thailand or something. So it is true, the fruit-eating population, a lot of them are very healthy and very skinny, very fit. Ruth Heydrich, you know, PhD, the famous triathlete who has survived metastatic, metastatic cancer for over 30 years. She loves to eat fruit as a pre-workout meal. She's actually transitioned. To eat. She, used to, she started out on the McDougal diet as she cured her cancer, so to speak, went into remission, but then she's moved towards eating a raw food diet. So I am going to agree there's a lot of extraordinarily healthy people that eat a lot of fruit. But then why do people sometimes criticize fruit? It gets criticized because it has a lot of fructose in it, and fructose is metabolized different than glucose, and if a person isn't exercising a significant amount, there is a risk that they will gain weight on the fruit. Dr. McDougall tells patients that are trying to control their weight to eat only two servings of fruit or less per day. The fructose will have a tendency if you ingest a lot of it. It's just, this is much more of a problem if you're eating the processed food, things like uh, sweetened beverages with high fructose corn syrup. There's also low-carb speakers. The most famous one is Dr. Lustig, and he basically says fructose is like the worst thing in the world. And he'll talk about how it's associated with obesity, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, and all this. But you have to also remember, the person's promoting all these low-carb, meat-type diets. They try to scapegoat and demonize fructose as a way to take attention away from all the problems with eating meat. So they exaggerate the problems of fructose. All right. And there's a famous ultramarathoner guy named Arnstein. I think his first name is Michael Arnstein. He eats about 25 to 30 pounds of fruit a day. You know, he's running really long distances, but he's a super fit guy. Um, and he's got, you know, plenty of YouTube videos. You can check him out. Durian Ryder's got lots of YouTube videos. Garth Davis got lots of YouTube videos. Um, okay, what else? Uh, Arnstein says his teeth look great. He doesn't get any cavities despite the sweets there. Um, let's see. Let's see. He, he eats um, a little bit of vegetables. Um, the only, only thing he takes is vitamin B12. All right, but again, a guy, he's an ultra marathoner, okay? He's gonna, a guy's going to run races of 50 miles and more, so he's going to burn a lot more calories than a regular person. He does say he loves eating b bananas at night, and he thinks it helps him to sleep better. He routinely eats 12 bananas at a time. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, Fred Bischy is this old super ager guy. I forget his age, probably around 90 or something. He's a big fan of raw fruits and vegetables. The other thing, people who eat these raw diets, they'll say, well, all other animals eat raw foods. We should too. Um, other people say, if you're just eating raw fruits and vegetables, unless you're eating the real high fat stuff, you'll have a hard time maintaining your body weight. Um, this lady, Janet Marie Wakelin, uh, she wrote a book called Raw Cures Cancer. She's another survivor for like over 20 years from metastatic breast cancer. I've seen that as a pattern, survivors of metastatic cancer who everybody thought was going to die, um, who've survived for decades, and they exercise a lot, and they eat 100% vegan, often with a lot of fruits. The fruits are low in protein, which is a good thing to help prevent pre cancer growth, it is thought. Of course, they just make the main emphasis, like T. Colin Campbell and China study, to eat plant protein rather than animal protein because plant protein's got a lot less leucine and methionine. That's the most important point. 
but I think it's probably helpful to lower your overall protein intake a bit, and fruits are good for that. They're alkaline, which is a good anti-cancer thing. They have antioxidants, that's a good anti-cancer thing, and they also are low in protein and low in fat, so that's all good. Fruits tend to be you know, significantly more expensive than starches. Um, a lot of people who eat lots of fruits claim it's given them more energy, better skin uh, complexion, better mood, and no constipation. I eat probably, you know, in the ballpark of about 35% of my calories from fruits in the ballpark of that. Uh, probably about 60% from starch and then the rest from vegetables. Okay, just a couple more thoughts on fruits. We talked about them. They taste great, but because they don't bump up sugar, your blood glucose that much, they don't raise insulin that much, they don't satisfy hunger as much. I wonder what they spray on apples, you know, that coating. I wonder if they spray MSG on there. I wonder if that wax, how it's processed by our body. That's one of the reasons why I stopped eating apples because I was like addicted to them. I would real quickly eat 12 of them. Um, you can't eat 12 potatoes real fast. Um, in nature, they tend to be more seasonal. Um, I don't like things like strawberries because of your regular outer surface. You know, I worry if it's got herbicides and pesticides on it, how can you clean it off? You can't. Um, grapes have such a thin skin around them. I worry that they're going to be contaminated, whatever they get sprayed with. Um, in a perfect world, I would eat an OMAD diet like at lunch or a late lunch. But in a practical world, when you have to work all day, it's more convenient to eat the OMAD diet at night. I don't want to eat an OMAD, you know, one meal a day diet in the morning because the morning's brain time. So if I have a day off in the morning, I always want to do something difficult intellectually, you know, read something complex or write something complex. So that's your key brain time because your brain's just cleaned itself overnight through the glymphatic system and you're fresh and energetic. So you're at, you're at your absolute smartest. You know, when does an animal need to be smart? When it's hungry. So after you've, in a sense, fasted while you're overnight sleeping, when you wake up in the morning, that's as smart as you get. The ghrelin also from the stomach has a uh, stimulation effect upon your hippocampus to also make you more alert and smarter. And if you eat, one thing about eating at night, the downside is if you eat a lot of well hydrated food, like a lot of plant foods are, then you're going to have to wake up to void, which you know can eventually start to interrupt your sleep. Um, Walter Kempner, MD, out in Durham, uh, Carolina, at Duke University, was super famous for having people lose tons and tons of weight. But they also were traveling to Durham, Carolina, under his supervision. They would be in these places called rice houses, so so sort of like a supervised outpatient. They would weigh in public in front of all the other people, so there was a social pressure. The person who lost 100 pounds would get their picture on the wall, the Centurion Club. They would put their blood pressures up on the wall and whatnot, their body weights on the wall. All he fed them was rice and fruits. Eventually, he let them eat a little more veggies and a few other things eventually, but predominantly rice and fruit. And these diets were calorie restricted, so it wasn't like they just ate ad libitum, whatever they wanted. But he had, you know, he had tons and tons of patients that lost over 100 pounds. He ended up treating overall about 19,000 patients. Eventually, most of his patients for, were for weight loss, but initially they were especially for treatment of hypertension and kidney failure. There's a lot of info on Kempner. I've given several other lectures about him. His research publications are available at drmcdougall.com. Uh, for our purposes in this lecture today, the most interesting thing is his diet. It was typically about 93% carbohydrate, only 4% protein. So that's important to know, 4% protein. The patients were doing great. You don't need any more than 4 He had incredible health improvements in his patients on a 4% protein diet and only 3% fat. Okay, here's one paper about Kempner having over 100, 106 patients who lost over 100 pounds of weight. Okay, so that's just like a typical Kempner thing. Dr. McDougall said he might be, probably is the best doctor who ever lived. The greatest doctor who ever lived. All right, he had, Kempner showed that you could reverse diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy. He kept records of the eye ground photographs and he would show patients who reversed their disease. Okay, he was reversing diabetes on a super high carbohydrate diet, 93% carbohydrates. It's extraordinary. He kept their chest x-rays, and many of them improved their chest x-ray. Part of that is because when they got less fat, they could lower their diaphragm more, and that caused the effect to decrease the size of the heart. But perhaps he reversed some congestive heart failure as well. Um, he, of course, lost tons of weight. Their blood pressures would quite often come down from systolics 200 or higher down to normal. 
Well, this lady, Jean Renfro Anspaugh, was a, a fat patient who went and lost weight out there in uh, Durham. And she wrote a book called Fat Like Us. It's a very entertaining book. You know, Durham, she called it the dieting capital of the world. All these fat people were making a pilgrimage, she called it, to, uh, to Durham. They felt the call. It was like Canterbury Tales, all kinds of funny language, you know. She talked about it. The pool out in Durham was the whale watch for all the fat people. She, she's got a lot of funny lingo. It's an entertaining book if you're interested in that. Oh, Kempner was a big-time ladies' man. That's a long story. We're not going to get into it today. Um, just briefly, you know, red blood cells are about 7 microns in diameter. A capillary is about 5 microns in diameter. So the red blood cells have to deform a little bit to pass through the capillary. Normal blood pressure, let's say something like 110 over 70. All right, that's an ideal blood pressure. Um, uh, with a hypertensive patient, they'll often have a wider pulse pressure, the number between, the distance between the systolic to the diastolic one. So this would be a pulse pressure of 100. Um, Rouleau formation is when the red blood cells are stuck together by a bridging molecule, typically most commonly LDL cholesterol. IgM antibodies can do it. Fibrinogen in an acute phase reactant with inflammation and stress from the liver can do it. Uric acid can do it from high fructose diets, for example. Um, when the red blood cells are stuck together into Rouleau formation, it means stack of coins in French, blood pressure has to go up to pump them through the capillary. So high fat diet is one of the major causes of hypertension. And I can tell you this, all the conventional medical school books, medical books are stupid on the topic of hypertension. They're going to tell you 90 to 95% of hypertension is called essential hypertension because the cause is unknown. That's completely stupid. It's not true. We all know that high fat meals cause hypertension. High sodium causes hypertension. Sodium because it's a vasoconstrictor. High fat meals because they make the blood sludge. As they thicken the blood, pressure has to go up to pump it through the circuit. So there's no mystery there. They call it a mystery because then you can sell drugs. Whenever you say nobody knows what causes something, then the next step is always buy our pill. Okay, so on the outside of red blood cells, they have a negative charge called the zeta potential. And that's formed by these what are called sialic acids, which are <clears throat> very much like a glucose with a carboxylic acid. There's a little more to it than that, but that's a useful way to think of them. And so the negative charges repel the other RBCs so they don't stick together. That's what you want. A bridging molecule is a positively charged molecule of adequate size that will stick the red blood cells together. <clears throat> By far the most common one is LDL cholesterol, but like we were just talking about, an IgM antibody with an acute infection can do that. Fibrinogen, which goes up in the blood with stress or inflammation, can do it. Uric acid goes up in the blood with a high meat diet or with a high fructose diet. Um, and those can also function as bridging molecules to stick the red blood cells together, causing a low formation, leading to increased blood pressure. The reason why elevated blood pressure, hypertension, is such a big deal, it's the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis and also for, for like intracranial silent strokes in the brain. I see tons of them every day. And the day of reading brain MRIs, I'll see thousands of them. And the reason is because the same patient can have like 100 of them. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about zeta potential. The higher the LDL cholesterol, the thicker the blood, the higher the blood viscosity because the more low formation you have. Okay, this was a paper like Peter Quo in the 1950s, and later his work was repeated by Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman. As a cardiologist, he took these patients with cardiac angina, chest pain related due to ischemia, arterial occlusion, and he showed that, stenosis or occlusion, and he showed that he checked the, the blood lipids on the patients every 30 minutes, and he showed that at peak lipemia with saturated fat peaking in the ballpark of around five hours, so you're going to have high lipemia, between about four to seven hours uh, with the saturated fat. With the unsaturated fat, you would have a more prolonged thickening of the blood. Uh, it was thickening the blood so much so, and for such a prolonged amount of time, the staff wanted to go home because uh, they'd start these ex experiments in the morning, and at nine hours, there was still real thick blood, blood sludge, if you will. Um, Ray Rosenman and Meyer Friedman, they would look at the person's the vessels in their eyes with an 80 times magnification microscope and they could see uh, the small arterioles in the eye stenosing or occluding even. Um, so you know high fat diet is a disaster for vascular health and every organ system in your body needs good blood flow in order to be healthy. Okay here's the Winkessel effect when the heart contracts it pushes blood into the ascending thoracic aorta 
The ascending thoracic aorta is stretched outward by the high pressure from cardiac contraction. It has elastic fibers that recoil inward during diastole. That's the relaxing phase of the heart. And this elastic recoil also helps to propel blood flow during diastole. So that's why the ascending thoracic aorta has been called the second heart. It's also been called the wind castle. Wind castle is like an accordion-like thing you use to blow air on the kindles to help start a fire. And after 20 years of age, these elastic fibers cannot be replaced. So if a person's been eating a high-fat diet, they're going to progressively destroy by overstretching these elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta, and they're going to lose their ability to generate good diastolic flow. And because of that, the body will compensate by having higher systolic pressure. That's also why you seldom see diastolic hypertension in people after 50 years of age, because they've lost their, their elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta, and they can't replace them. Okay, normal blood flow should be a parabolic velocity profile. Red blood cells in the center, white blood cells adjacent, and then plasma along the periphery. And um, that's called laminar blood flow. When the arterial blood flow comes up, it'll hit a branch point. And here's like one of the most common locations of atherosclerosis in the human body is the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery goes to the brain. External carotid artery goes to the face. And by the way, it's the same thing happening in all the branch points, at, branch points at other locations in the body, like in the coronary arteries. Those are two of the main initial spots where atherosclerosis occurs. Um, so the blood flow comes up. The higher the pressure, the worse it is, and it hits the median divider. It bounces off the median divider, and it'll have a lot of turbulent flow. It'll also have these retrograde um, eddy currents. So retrograde flow, slow flow, they're called eddy currents. And the point is there's always going to be some under normal conditions, but under... The worse the hypertension, the more of this there is. And when there's a lot of this retrograde flow and, retro and turbulent flow, it confuses the arterial lining cells in the internal carotid artery. And they sense that there's an arterial injury and they start to downregulate. Actually, they shed their glycocalyx of antithrombotic materials, things like heparin sulfate, antithrombin-3, and they express more of these vascular cell adhesion type molecules that are prothrombotic. So you'll form little blood clots along the outer wall away from the median divider within the internal carotid artery. Then endothelial precursor cells will cover it up and that's how the clot and the cholesterol get into the subendothelium. It contains cholesterol because of the LDL cholesterol sticking the red blood cells together because of Rouleau formation. And that's how cholesterol gets trapped in the arterial wall. It's covered with endothelial precursor cells that are circulating in the blood. Okay, then you end up with a steady state of reabsorption and um, new formation, okay? So you want to break the cycle by minimizing your dietary fat. Eventually, as people get older, they're less able to, able to control the process, and the atherosclerosis tends to progress more rapidly and get ahead of them and start causing problems like strokes or heart attacks in the coronary arteries. So here's your endothelial cells, the lining cells of your arteries, and they're typically spindle-shaped, and they're lined up in the direction of blood flow, okay? So normal laminar flow flows over them. They have mechanoreceptors that sense the direction of flow. When there's turbulent flow, it confuses those mechanoreceptors. Okay, here's just some of the things that an endothelial cell does. It has uh, antithrombin-3 and heparin sulfate on its surface with their negative charges, so the endothelial cell has its own zeta potential. Okay, it releases in particular for our purposes, we care about NO as nitric oxide, and that helps prevent platelets sticking together. So it prevents platelet aggregation, and it also dilates these arteries. It causes relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle. So nitric oxide is your friend, vasodilating the smooth muscle. Um, potassium also helps to keep these smooth muscle cells dilated, as does magnesium. Pa potassium and magnesium both come from plant foods, whereas high sodium tends to cause the effect of constriction of the smooth muscle cells. And when they're contracted, when I say constriction, I mean contraction there, that raises blood pressure, and you don't want that. Can coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis be reversed? Yes, partially. An atherosclerotic plaque contains lipid core, like from the cholesterol and whatnot, and from the red blood cell plasma membranes broken down. That can be reabsorbed. The necrotic material, that can be reabsorbed. Um, the acute clot, that can be uh, partially reabsorbed. There's going to be fibrous tissue. <clears throat> The old chronic fibrous tissue is relatively acellular. That cannot be reabsorbed. The calcification, that cannot be reabsorbed. 
but the early fibrous tissue that's still relatively cellular, that can be partially reabsorbed. <clears throat> so the point is you can shrink an atherosclerotic plaque by resorbing the parts of it that can be reabsorbed. And also importantly, the endothelial cells, yeah, this is EPC for endothelial precursor cells, but it reforms an endothelium over the clot. Those can start to function again and produce more nitric oxide to vasodilate the artery. So you can get dramatic improvements in blood flow, and that's a wonderful, important thing. Okay, the patterns of atherosclerosis. The Western atherosclerosis pattern is primarily in the coronary arteries and in the carotid arteries from these high-fat diets versus there's something called the Asian pattern of atherosclerosis, like in Japan, and they were eating tons of sodium, like you know, 14 grams a day, and they were smoking a lot of cigarettes, and that was associated with hypertension, and they would have a tendency to get intracranial atherosclerosis, increasing their risk of stroke. And I'm going to show you this table, and this table is a really great thing, and this is also why people will say to me, oh, why are you so confident? And I'm going to tell you, it's obvious. Spend some time studying epidemiology. Look at the Yanomamo in South America. Look at the Tatahumata versus the Pima. Look at any of these other emigration studies. It's just obvious, okay? The American diet is high, especially in saturated fat. They get tons of coronary artery disease. It's the most common cause of death. They get tons of hypertension, diabetes. They have lots of strokes. It's very routine for the men to be impotent. You know, more than half the men are impotent by around 50 years of age. Okay, that's pathetic. Um, they have a very high incidence of cancer. Then you look at the East Asians. That's like the Japanese, Koreans, Chinese. And they, they are typically, traditionally, the Japanese, especially eating tons of sodium, giving them hypertension. They're also smoking lots of cigarettes, again, contributing to hypertension. That's associated with intracranial atherosclerosis and strokes. Because they ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, that helped to protect them to a large degree from cancer and from diabetes. Um, they didn't eat much saturated fat. Now, the South Asians, those are like people from India. The thing that gets them in trouble is they tend to eat a lot of fried foods with those omega-6 cooking oils. So despite the fact that they're often quite skinny and they will call themselves vegetarians, they also eat this ghee butter stuff that's dairy product with can be high in saturated fat. But the big thing, as far as my reading can tell, and from my talking to uh, persons that eat that way, is that the high omega-6 oils are predisposing them to uh, a lot of diabetes. And that's especially the research work of Dr. Yamashima, Dr. Tetsumori Yamashima. And his research concluded that lipid peroxidation of omega-6 cooking oils not only damages the brain, increasing the risk of dementia, but it damages the pancreatic beta cells, decreasing their ability to produce insulin. And he thinks that's why a lot of persons of uh, Indian descent have diabetes, even though they're not that fat. Okay, so you see all this suffering and disease, and then you say to yourself, well, how could I escape that? And here's the best you could do. Low fat will really mean very low fat. Low sodium, vegan diet. It's low in all these diseases. I mean, the incidence of hypertension amongst the Yanomamo and the Tatahumar, it's about zero, okay? Whereas in Americans, it's like everybody practically over 50 or 60. They all get hypertensive. They all get coronary artery disease. If you eat a herbivore, a high-fat diet, it's going to get coronary artery disease, okay? It's going to get atherosclerosis. So this is wonderful news. I mean, it doesn't get any better in health than that. And like I said, we're not talking about a close match, you know, a wrestling match in the finals where one guy wins five to four. No, we're talking zero persons, Tadahumara, Pima, I'm sorry, Tadahumara, Yanomamo, that eat this way. None of them get hypertension, zero, versus the people who eat these high-fat, high-sodium diets. Almost all of them eventually get hypertension, and they're sick much younger, okay? So anyways, there it is. You can take it or leave it. I just let you know. I try to give you a chance. I feel sorry for patients. Patients are so sick and so pathetic, and I can tell you, most people don't age well. Most people never get better. All these diseases are called chronic because the patient never gets better. What's the cure rate with pills for hypertension? Zero. It's never cured. What's the cure rate for diabetes with pills? Zero. It's never cured. What's the effective pill that cures obesity? None. Zero. Okay, they've tried things in the past, but they all had a lot of side effects. And the same diet that protects you from obesity, it protects you from tumor promotion, so it helps dramatically reduce your risk of cancer. Okay, I call my version of the diet the Spartan Vegan Diet because it's real sparse in what it offers and because of my background as a wrestler. 
I've got separate videos on Spartan vegan diet. Okay, this is just one thing to show you that all these animal foods, they're really high in fat. Look at salmon, 50% fat. Even your so-called lean chickens, about 25% fat. You notice there's no carbohydrate in meat. The only so-called meat product with carbohydrate is milk, okay? The rest of them are all just animal protein, which is a very bad thing for health, and animal fat, which is also a very bad thing for your health. Uh, look at salmon, 50% fat. And uh, there's another reason why I'm not a fan of soy. It's like 37% fat. It's really high in fat compared. It's the fattest of all the beans that are eaten routinely. The next fattest bean is garbanzos at about 13%. So fat is like three times as fat as garbanzo beans. And it's full of estrogen, okay? The last thing in the world I want to eat is a really high fat food full of estrogen, okay? And it just goes to show you how good advertising can be that there's tons of people on the internet that love soy and none of them's ever read the papers on it. The more you read the papers on it, the more you want to avoid it. Oatmeal is 15, 16% fat, which is like relatively fat for grain, but that's still a pretty low amount, and you could eat oatmeal and be real healthy. Um, these fruits are really low in fat. Look at apples, about 3% calories from fat. Blueberries, about 5% fat. And then we talked about potatoes, white rice, sweet potatoes, only about 1% fat. So all those things help a person optimize their body weight. Oh, here's just another chart. I got more stuff listed in their fat. Flaxseed, about 71% fat. I'm not going to eat that stuff. These nuts, 70 to 90% fat. All oils are 100% fat. Um, in my opinion, you shouldn't have one drop of oil. Okay, um, and again, the fruits are real low in fat. They're real low in protein, so those are some good things about fruits. Olive oil, a lot of people have an emotional attachment to olive oil. Like I got Greek friends, and man, you can't criticize olive oil in front of them or they'll cry or, or punch you. They get real upset. Okay, olive oil, all kinds of problems with it. It raises postprandial triglycerides. It causes decreased arterial vasodilation in the flow-mediated vasodilation test. It's not good for you. Any type of fat you eat is going to end up increasing your atherosclerosis risk. Blank and Horn's paper in 1978 showed that all the fats increase atherosclerosis. They're all bad for arterial health. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of other papers showing all these problems with them. I recommend avoiding all of them. The MUFAs are not protective for atherosclerosis. I think all that stuff, you know, saying olive oil and nuts are good for your arteries, I think it's bogus. I think it's corporate-sponsored research from my reading of it. VegSource uh, has good videos on all the problems with nuts. That's run by Jeff Nelson. He's a real smart guy. This is just a nomenclature for these fats. Um, this is more stuff on oils. Uh, oleic acid, like um, olive oil, it'll increase factor 7, a clotting factor, as does, you know, sat fat, uh, palmitic acid, C16, and no double bonds. Um, we talked about how fats increase insulin resistance, especially saturated fat. They all promote obesity, which is going to lead towards more uh, diabetes as well and insulin resistance. You get plenty of omega-3 fats from just eating plant foods. You don't need to eat any other source of them. Um, Nathan Pritikin says one bowl of oatmeal gives you all the fat you need. Uh, like I said, you need less than 1% fat in your diet. Uh, and it's impossible to be that low. It's impossible to be too low in fat. You should forget about it. What people tend to be deficient in the United States is potassium, magnesium, and fiber because they all come from plant foods and they're not eating enough plant foods. Kepner didn't allow his patient to eat nuts, nor does Dr. Esselstyn. Um, well, here's a quote from Neil Bernard. He also says, leafy greens have lots of essential fatty acids and are the best source of omega-3 fats. Okay, problems with fish oil, they cause immunosuppression, they increase your risk of diabetes, they increase your risk of prostate cancer. I got separate lectures on all the problems with the omega-3 fats and olive oil. And the, what I see it is lots of people get trapped in a positive reinforcement feedback cycle, like a vicious cycle where they're eating the high-fat food, it's raising their dietary set point to make them fatter, it's causing insulin resistance, which leads to increased mTOR, which makes them fatter. And all these things keep going to make them fatter and fatter, and they just perpetuate the cycle. And the only way to break the cycle is... Stop eating all these high-fat foods. Avoid these estrogenic chemicals, these obesogens. That's what you got to do. You'll, you'll lower your set point. So anyways, that's it for lecture uh, number seven on causes of obesity. And the emphasis in this lecture was ways that a person could lose weight.